Welcome to Polaris Live. This is Sarwar Kashmiri welcoming our viewers from around the world to the first of two programs that launch our fourth season. Polaris Live seeks to understand from multiple perspectives and through the eyes of experts from around the world reasons for the dangerous daggers drawn status of the most consequential relationship in the world that between the United States and China. It is our objective to try and improve mutual understanding between the two superpowers and attempt to find practical ways to reduce tensions. Polaris Live is brought to you live in conjunction with the Foreign Policy Association in New York. You can ask questions by using the bar on the right-hand side of the screen. As a reminder, polarislive.com is a commercial-free viewer-supported channel. You can help us by subscribing to our YouTube channel and newsletters at kashmiri.com. Let me apologize for being a few minutes late, but here we are. My guest today, in the first of two programs that will launch Polaris Live's fourth season, is Dr. David Daokui Lee. Professor Li is a Chinese economist, Mansfield Freeman Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for China in the World Economy at Tsinghua University School of Economics and Management. His recent book, China's Worldview, Demystifying China to Prevent World Conflict, is already being hailed as a signal contribution to the relationship between the U.S. and China. In the book, he explains the inner workings of, a China, of China to help the world understand how it works and how to work with it. It is in bookstores now, and we would strongly recommend getting hold of it. We've provided a link on my website, www.kashmiri.com. Uh, and let me now welcome to Polaris Live, Dr. Lee. A pleasure to have you with us, David. Uh, thank you, Sanwar, for having me, and uh, it's really exciting at the beginning of the year to be on your program. I'm very happy to interact with your mm -hmm. audience about my well, new book, China's Worldview. Yes, uh, there you go. My goodness. Uh, I want you to know I have, uh, thanks to Chelsea, your assistant, a uh, electronic uh, review copy, and I've read the introduction, I've read the conclusion, and I intend to finish it before this week is out. So, and it's a really fabulous read. <clears throat> so let me uh, wish you in advance a uh, happy uh, uh, New Year, uh, and I know it's the year of the dragon, and let me start by asking you uh, that do years of dragon promote peace between countries? Uh, certainly, uh, the year of dragon uh, usually is associated with many changes. So uh, this year, um, I think we should be ready, and actually we should be looking forward to many changes in the world, including the U.S. You may have uh, you may have a new president. I, would, I, I don't take sides, but uh, you, you are having a presidential election. And in yes. China, we are having a lot of uh, policy adjustments, especially with uh, the economy and the finance. Right. It's uh, Well, listen, one key message of your book, David, is that the rise of China is good not just for the United States and the West, but for people in every part of the world. So it is in everyone's interest, as you say, to clear up misunderstandings and anxieties about China. So what are, in your opinion, a couple of the key misunderstandings about China and the United States? Well, I think the biggest misunderstanding in the U.S., especially um, and broadly in the West, is that uh, China is um, of is running a system which is expanding to the rest of the world, much like uh, the former Soviet Union or like the uh, the past of the U.S. after World War II. So when China is rising, China will replace the U.S. and running the world. I think that's the biggest mis misunderstanding of China. And underneath this mi misunderstanding of China is a myth 
the myth is that uh, China is um, a communist country, uh, like the former Soviet Union, and the, the Communist Party in China is bent on expanding its international influence. And this is totally wrong. Okay, in the book, I spend uh, a lot of time, actually at least one third of the um, energy of the book, uh, explaining how the government, especially the party, works in China. Uh, my, but my simple one-line explanation is that the Communist Party in China is actually a continuation of 2,000 years of a very sophisticated political system in China. It has its own internal logic of governing the country. And also by implication, the Communist Party in China is not in the business of expanding its uh, practice of governance to the rest of the world, especially not to expand its uh, practice of governance to developing countries, uh, to what do you call the emerging market economies. So this is the uh, 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 key point of the book. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. And may I uh, also uh, take the opportunity to ask you the reverse, uh, which is what do you think are a couple of key uh, misunderstandings about America and China? Um, you mean the misunderstanding of China about the U.S.? Is that the, the, the reverse question? Uh, yes, please. Okay, uh, the reversely, in China, many people believe that the U.S. is run like China itself. Uh, that is, the U.S. is monolithic. That is, the president of the U.S. represents everybody in the U.S. This is totally wrong. As ah. you know, the U.S. is running on a system of um, divided power. So oftentimes, what the president says may not be uh, implemented in policy. Actually, may not be even. Uh, represent uh, the majority of the um, politicians and people in the U.S. So in other words, uh, the Chinese people oftentimes, oftentimes they take the U.S. president and the, uh, some of the U.S. congressmen and the senators too seriously. So they overreact to some of the extreme opinions of the, U of the U.S. politicians, including former President Trump. So they get angry. And they take the belief that the U.S. is bent on cracking down China and uh, preventing, try to prevent China's rise. I think that's not the reality. The U.S. Mm. is actually a system of uh, multiple, multiple of many, many factions. And the majority of the population in the U.S. actually uh, are more concerned about their daily life they're concerned about whether the rights of China can bring more business and uh, job opportunities to themselves. And in this regard, I can say uh, for sure that the rights of China overall is good for people on the street in the U.S. Specifically, they will the rights mm -hmm. of China will bring more job opportunities to American people, uh, cheaper products for American people, and also provides uh, more, what do we call, uh, uh, international public goods, uh, such as international peacekeeping, such as um, uh, a better control of climate change. And also the rise of China will bring necessary, I emphasize necessary competition for um, the American society. Look at the U.S. universities. The U.S. universities are among the best in the world, but unfortunately, for the past decades, they were starving off uh, necessary funding from the federal government until, until the rise of China posts a threat to uh, U.S. research so that congressmen, actually senators like uh, Chuck Schumer, proposed uh, their legislation, which eventually run uh, turning to law to provide more funding for U.S. Uh, science technology development. So these are the three areas in which the rights of China will be good for China, would be good for American people. Better jobs, more uh, pro cheaper products, uh, better international public goods so that the U.S. do not have to pay uh, as much as before for these public goods and healthy, necessary competition. Well, thank you. For, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to dig a little deeper into into this, David, you know, because like a lot of people, 
I'm always also confused that we live in an age of instant communication, the internet. You know, unlike, uh, you know, the, the 100, 200, 300 years ago, everyone knows as much as they can as, as, the, as the news progresses. But let me ask you, I, uh, a few months ago, the New York Times asked its readers to imagine two poor 18-year-old people, one in the U.S. and the other in China. And the New York Times asked its readers, who has a better chance of success? And the article's headline provided the answer. The American dream is alive, but in China. Right? So might it be that one aspect, of America's concern rate China's rapid improvement of its poorer and middle-class citizens is that China's success might influence developing countries into believing that China's way of running its country is better for its masses than America's for its citizens. I wonder if there's something in that, that it's a very deep difference between the two that continues even now, three years since Polaris Live has been on the air, the relationship seems to get worse rather than better. What do you think? Is uh, this Sawa, one of the salient points? Yes, uh, Sawa, you asked some very, very important and very uh, pointed, a very a perceptive question. Okay, let me answer that one. Okay, so uh, to begin with, despite uh, the convenience of internet, there's still tremendous, tremendous misinformation about other nations uh, from the perspective of any nation, whether it's the U.S. about China or China about the U.S., or Europe about, the, about the China, China about Europe. Okay, still tremendous amount of misunderstanding. That's why you and me, people like you and me, are still very important in. Um, in bringing information to the other side. Uh, now the question of whether whether China's success in uh, bringing uh, young people to uh, uh, to better life will, will, will imply that China will be followed as a model by developing countries. Well, the answer is no. The answer is no. Let me say this very carefully hmm. because because okay, because China's political, social, political system is, uh, to be very frank, very complicated. Very complicated. It's built on two thousand years of um, uh, social governance. Two thousand years. Two thousand years of uh, of um, Chinese civil servants, uh, Chinese culture, Confu starting with Confucianism, so that it is very difficult, almost impossible. For China to um, to export its uh, governance system to a country like Pakistan, and meanwhile, more important, mm -hmm. let me offer the most important, let me emphasize, it is not it is not in the in, at intention of uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party and the Chinese government overall to export a Chinese social political system. Take the example of Pakistan. Well, Pakistan is uh, regarded, actually it's true, as we, we call all-weather friend of China. All-weather, you know, weatherproof, weatherproof, <laughs> weatherproof uh, uh, partner of China, okay? It's a fact, it's a fact, okay? However, to my best knowledge, there's no single Chinese military advisor stationed in Pakistan helping Pakistani military there's no um, got senior government officials from China uh, stationed in Pakistan to teach Pakistan how to plan its economy, how to um, manage its uh, money, how to manage its uh, physical policy. Zero, to my best knowledge. So China is not in the business of, of teaching, in quotation marks, teaching Pakistani how to run its country. Okay? To the contrary, I would believe, okay, again, to my best knowledge, the, the US government through whatever, CIA, through uh, FBI, have more outreach to Pakistani pol politics than Chinese, okay? So it is not in the habit. Also, it's not in the capacity of the Chinese uh, government to export its uh, system uh, to a country like Pakistan. 
South Africa, the same thing. Remember the uh, Nelson Mandela? Nelson Mandela was a fan of Mao Zedong. So you would think the ANC, the African National Congress, when taking power, would come to China to learn from Chinese practice and to, uh, to copy Chinese uh, political system. So South Africa, no. The, end, the reality is no. China is not exporting, it's not teaching, not coaching South Africa. So whatever, okay, whatever reason, whatever it, the, the bottom line is China is not, is not for good or for bad, it's not an evangelical, that's not a country. The Chinese Communist Party is not an evan, evangel, uh, evangelical. Am I pronouncing it right? Evangelical. Do you understand? Follow me? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But but let me let me be rude. Let me be rude. Let me be rude and interrupt, Dr. Lee, sure. uh, because I'm going to press this a little more. Uh, sure. uh, I am not I am not uh, in the camp of people who believe that China wants to proactively export its model, because, as you say, it's based on thousands of years uh, and will not work necessarily in other countries. But I'm approaching it from the way the New York Times did. In this article, they had a graph that showed what happened to 800 million poor uh, and uh, uh, people at the poverty line in China and how their life has improved. And they had another line showing that over 30 years, the same 30 years, the American middle class pretty much stagnated, stayed level or even went down a little bit. So I'm not asking you whether China will export. I am asking you, as people watch this, as people say, you know, 30 years, China's gone from uh, a developing country to now almost a superpower. Well, why don't we think, why don't we look at China's system more than the the West. So what I'm saying is China's accomplishments will influence, might they influence other countries? And I wonder if this is one of the key concerns that keeps the U.S. and China at daggers drawn. Did I lose you, David? Did I lose you, David? Yeah, did I lose you, David. Did you hear? Did you yes, hear my question? I heard your question. You are saying whether uh, many developing countries are learning from China without Chinese coaching them, right? <laughs> okay. Exactly right. And then saying that this idea of democracy and liberal governance and so on, look at China. That's maybe that's what, is this what scares us? Okay. Now, let me answer straightforward to your question. My straightforward question is that when they look very carefully at the Chinese practice of social economic governance, they will find, they will find traces of spirits of the U.S. and the British, British, U.S., British uh, political thinking or economic thinking 100 years ago. In other words, if they look carefully at the Chinese example, they actually copy many of the U.S. American practice. That's how China did it. China had today's economic achievements, partly uh, to a large extent, uh, thanks to its learning from the past economic practice of the US, of the UK, of Germany, mm. of Japan. Okay, that is the government supporting the free market. The government maintain law and order, law and order, not necessarily rule of law. So actually, if they copy from the Chinese success, in the end, they will get a lot of good practice, not today's practice of the US, of the UK the good practice of the US, UK in the old days. So am I <laughs> clear enough? So so no worry. So I, I, in other words, in many, oftentimes, let me give you an example. One minister, one very important minister, I wouldn't name his name, okay? I wouldn't get him in trouble. Told my students in a, in a conference 
that there's no Beijing consensus. There's only Washington consensus. Mm. China's success is can be attributed partly to Chinese being a good student of of many of the Washington con consensus. So why worry? Why worry about uh, the global thoughts copying right. Chinese success? And in the end, they copy part of the Washington consensus. Okay, it's uh, uh, let me take a, a moment, uh, David, to remind our viewers that polarislive.com is commercial free only because it is viewer supported channel. And you can help us by subscribing to our YouTube channel and our newsletter, which is on my website. And now let's get back to our guest, Dr. David Daokui Li. Uh, I was intrigued, David, with your explanation about the historical importance of Taiwan to China. And you actually provided an analogy, which uh, although, as you say, was approximate, but I had not read before, which is, uh, uh, which is what would happen if Hawaii uh, had become, uh, after the Second World War, you know, uh, the compromise uh, and removed, uh, you know, and, and wouldn't America want to get uh, Hawaii back into the mainland? Uh, and would you just quickly, if you can, explain explain that uh, and uh, then I want to tangent from there to connect it to the election in Taiwan and the American government sending a delegation to uh, congratulate the Taiwanese. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to get into that because I think it's crucially important. Yeah, thank you very much for bringing up this issue. So my point is very simple, that is Taiwan is actually a uh, very important uh, symbol of the past history, past 150 years of history. Uh, during that part of history, China was beginning at the beginning a uh, united uh, empire, and then uh, it lost a war against the Japanese. And then Taiwan as an island was given to uh, Japan. And then after World War II, Taiwan was supposed to be reunited with the mainland. However, due to uh, internal conflicts between the Communist Party and the Nationalist Party, Taiwan uh, became uh, a separate, separate, uh, separate entity from the mainland, although the Nationalist Party occupying Taiwan had been stating that Taiwan and mainland China should be united, even though the Nationalist was uh, in effect in control of Taiwan. So, in this regard, let's imagine, let's imagine the U.S. lost uh, a war against the Japan, and then, um, and then uh, the, the island of Hawaii, the islands of Hawaii uh, were uh, separated from the mainland uh, U.S. And then after winning uh, the war against Japan, uh, Hawaii remained to be independent, uh, running by a different party uh, from the Democrats or nation or the uh, Republicans, and then the the issue is uh, Hawaii and the mainland should be re reunited in order to reconcile with the history, in order to have a claim that the U.S. has fully won a war against Japan. That's the analogy here. So that's the issue here. So my point is that. Uh, the Taiwan issue is much more important than it seems to be. It is uh, it is issue of uh, uh, settling uh, the past 150 years of humiliating history uh, for mainland China. Well, thank thank you for that. And then uh, uh, you know we've just seen the Taiwanese election, and we've uh, now heard that uh, President Biden is going to send a bipartisan congressional delegation to uh, uh, to congratulate Taiwan on uh, another uh, uh, another election uh, how do you think that's going to be received by China and uh, we uh, what do you think well from a Chinese perspective this is um, uh, very offensive because from the Chinese perspective the US president the US president should represent the U.S. Uh, in its foreign policy, not the congressman. 
so that the U.S. Uh, president should honor its uh, long-standing commitment to so-called One China. That is, uh, that is, Taiwan should be part of um, mainland China. But now the U.S. president is sending its delegates to congratulate uh, a local election, the winner of a local election, because from the uh, U.S. foreign policy standpoint of view, Taiwan should be a local government. So this is like this is like a Chinese uh, central government sending a delegation to the state of Massachusetts when the Mass Massachusetts uh, elected uh, a pro-independent uh, 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 governor. The governor wants Massachusetts to be separate from the from the U.S. federal from the U United States. So this is the tricky issue. Is like this. Okay. So uh, I I do not think that it's it's a, a problem policy uh, from the U.S. if the U.S. president wants to maintain a stable relationship with China. Okay. Well, it's, uh, uh, you know, you know better than most people how the American system works. You've spent a lot of time here uh, and your writing demonstrates how deeply you understand how it works. So my own hope is that uh, the China will keep in mind that this is an election year when funny things happen uh, and not overreact to it. But that's just Sarwar Kashmiri speaking uh, from my low pedestal. Uh, but yeah. let me, uh, sorry. You, you're absolutely right, Sarwar. You're absolutely right. We, we, you and I see this issue eye on eye, okay? Uh, I to I sit on this issue. That is, we both understand the, Ch and we both, uh, I think, we we both would suggest the Chinese uh, top officials to stay cool, to remain cool about uh, candidates, presidential candidates, and the congressional candidates uh, in the U.S. in and in other countries during uh, uh, campaign, because oftentimes Chinese government protests. Against the, whether it's uh, candidate Trump or is can, candidate uh, DeSantis are actually counterproductive. Yes, they're, co they're counterproductive. They actually help with the uh, the candidates uh, that the Chinese government doesn't want to be elected. Okay, I'm not saying that China should interfere in the U.S. election. What I'm saying is that any outside comments about the about the policies and the rhetorics of the uh, uh, candidates can prove to be counterproductive, and in the end, it helps nobody. So thank you for that. And um, and as we run out of time, I do want to ask you. Uh, there is a lot of talk and headlines about the world order changing from a unipolar U.S.-West driven order to a bipolar China-U.S. Uh, order going forward. Uh, and now we see the countries of the global south exerting their influence as they grow, India, Brazil, South Africa, Argentina, and so on, as they grow into uh, uh, more powerful and influential countries. Do you yourself uh, believe that we have passed uh, that uh, change of order and that we are all trying to adjust to it? And also, do you believe that this global South will exert a greater influence as we go along? Oh, for sure, the global South will have more influence in international affairs. However, I do want to emphasize, I do want to emphasize that China is not, is not trying to uh, support the global South to go against the U.S. Again, let me go back to my theme of the book. The Chinese system is internally coherent is not willing to expand. The Chinese political system is, as economic term shows, is have a decreasing scale of economy, okay? In a, when the scale goes up, the efficiency goes down. So China is not in the interest, does not have the interest to expand its influence in global thoughts. However, as, a, as a, you pointed out, the global thoughts will try to study very carefully the story of Chinese success. And when they study the success of the Chinese uh, economy, Chinese society, they will find, actually, they will appreciate, they will appreciate more many of the fundamental principles uh, of the US, of the UK, which they followed during their uprising uh, uh, era, okay? So 
again, so the, the rise of China is reminding everybody the fundamentals are important. The fundamentals being respecting the market, supporting the market, uh, respecting property rights, uh, supporting people's uh, economic freedom, and also gradually give people more voice in public decision making. Also gradually give, give people, uh, especially young people who are aspiring, who are hardworking, a chance to move up in politics or in, uh, in social governance and in the economy. So again, I do not think uh, China is that far away from the US and the UK in its actual practice. If you take out the name Communist Party, okay, in, in essence, in essence, there are many common values that China and the US and the West actually share. Well, with that wonderful, optimistic uh, tone from your side, uh, uh, Professor Lee, we've run out of time. Uh, and so I'm going to have to say uh, goodbye on this program. But I want to remind our viewers, please get hold of Dr. Lee's new book. Uh, it provides one of the best ways to understand China and how it works. Uh, you'll find a link on my website and you can order it from there. Uh, it really is hugely well done and educational. So thank you, David, for taking the time to help launch Polaris Live's new season. I hope you will come back and see us again. Thank you, Sangwa. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you to our viewers from around the world. Please join us again tomorrow when Dr. Devi Fortuna Anwar from Indonesia will join us from Jakarta for the second launch program uh, in this series, exploring the most consequential relationship in the world. Until then, goodbye.